society than anyone I know. He's a graduate of Southern University, Baton Rouge, 1971. I happen to be a member of that class as well. I'm very proud of him as my classmate. He is an individual who grew up in humble beginnings in a little town in central Louisiana known as Lakeland, Louisiana. <laughs> He has about half the city here with him tonight. <laughs> okay. He has a distinguished career in the military. He's received the Bronze Star, 33rd Commanding General of the First Army. He has had stations at Fort Benning, Georgia, as well as South Korea. He has contributed more, and I'm not going to take away any of his thunder. I think you see what's coming about here, so I'll let him talk about that. But basically, when it came time to rescue individuals in New Orleans, he was in charge of Joint Task Force Katrina. And he had to provide information to interview that they were on a rescue mission. They were here to save lives. And he did a splendid job. And he's really to be honest with what he did. This is the 10th anniversary of Katrina. We were actually here 10 years ago with our organization, right before Katrina. And because of people like him, New Orleans more or less is thriving today, or is moving back in terms of the mainstream of the U.S. economy. At this time, I want to bring up Lieutenant General Russell Honore, U.S. Army, retired. As I tell uh, 
when I go to speak with engineers or computer scientists, uh, what you are creating in these institutions are not people with a specific skill, but we need you to produce leaders. We get all the mechanics we need. Architects will find their way to the table. Engineers will find their way to the table. People who know how to run a plus and minus sheet, a PL sheet, they'll show up. But what the world needs now is leadership. People who understand that the business of leadership requires sacrifice. And uh, we are here today because those who have preceded us did what they had to do to be successful. It wasn't always the best brick and mortar school that they went to. Wasn't always the most modern institutions they went to, but they, they found a way to adapt and overcome. So we ride on their shoulders. And for a few minutes tonight, I want to reflect at a point in time in our history, about 238 years ago, when people really had it hard to get things done. And I look around the room here every time I see Representative James here, I get get prepared to be told no in the Natural Resource Committee or a bill I'm trying to uh, project to protect poor people, air and health. So, uh, Mr. Representative James, good to see you tonight, uh, one of our political leaders from the state. Uh, but as we look into the 21st century, uh, we're going to have to find different ways to do what we do now. And the challenge centered around this, ladies and gentlemen, you affect of uh, uh, knowledge globally with the students that you prepare to send out. Uh, you send them out to take on challenges of being good business leaders, to, to teach others the practice of business. Uh, but the challenge is this. Uh, 15 years ago, we had 5.8 billion people in the world. Today, uh, we've got 7 billion. That's in 15 years. That's how fast the population grew. And it grew based on uh, uh, tech, the advancement of technology, our ability to communicate. Fifteen years ago, a thousand children died a day because of that stuff sitting on the table that called water. A thousand children died a day because of bad water. Today, uh, 500 children die a day because of bad water. Because of technology, the world got to know about this, and the information was passed, and the need was built, and the funds to go out around the world and save people's lives has just exponentially changed uh, the world as we know it. 5.8 to 10 billion to 7 billion people. We're on a trajectory toward 10 billion. That means the students that you're preparing, they've got to be successful. As a nation, the United States of America, we're the third largest population, led by China and India. Uh, China still leads India, but uh, India is closing in on them. Matter of fact, by the time the speech is over, India, India might pass China. <laughs> <laughs> They're working on it. They've got about, each have about 1.3 billion people. Ladies and gentlemen, if you count those numbers, if you look at what we have in the United States, we, we have about 312 million people that we know about. <laughs> Honestly. That means they have about a billion more people than we do. That ought not scare us. It ought to make this a challenge. Because out of challenges come opportunities. Because the leaders that you're going to create I'm going to look at every challenge as an opportunity. We've got to change the mindset of our leaders, of our young people. When you look at a problem, that's an opportunity. Matter of fact, as a dean, I want all of you to go back while you're riding on a plane or driving back home, and I want you to create a list, and I want you to put it outside the door of your office. What are the things that you know of today that are impossible? Because you see all the opportunities on the other side of the impossible. Things that we can't do today are going to be the things tomorrow that's going to make a lot of wealth. And it's going to create opportunities for people. It's going to keep more people alive. And it's going to save more lives. So it's imperative that we have a list 
of things that we think today that are impossible because that has to be the challenge of your students, the ones that's really going to make a difference in the world. Again, of that 7 million people in there, this is why they've got to do the impossible. 2 million don't have energy or power in their homes. They can't do this, turn the light on and turn uh, power on in their home. 2 million of the 7 million people in the world today, they have no energy in their homes. Per se, as far as electricity, they can run computers and run the refrigerators and uh, run television. They don't have it. Or turn lights on in your room. They don't have it. Another 2 billion uh, don't have the luxury that we have tonight to have a clean glass of water that they can draw in their homes. They have to go somewhere else to draw that water or bring it into the home to drink. They don't have running water inside their home. Now think about that. This is the 21st century. Two million people, no energy, no power in their homes, and no clean running water in their homes. That's a challenge. But the students you are training today are educated. They will be the leaders that's going to have to solve those problems. Because as we go from 7 to 10 billion people, the problems are going to get bigger. The challenge will get larger. Because the more people we generate, the more they, problems we're going to have to solve. And around the world today, as we look at the expanding global population, uh, they have not to create friction. This one idea of water. We got less clean water today than we had yesterday on the globe. And right here in Louisiana, and in the place where you came from. The sad thing is, we have less clean water all morning when we get up than we got today. Because what we are doing in our industrial base, the use of that water, and how we're treating that water, we've got a big, we can't do problem right at the end of the Mississippi River. We got an 800 square mile dead zone out there. And for some people say, well, how did that happen? Well, when I was growing up in Point B Parish, and a guy named Tom Smith, her daddy, taught me agriculture and leadership. Uh, if I raised 85 bushels of corn an acre, He'd take me down to Southern University over at LSU and I'd get a blue ribbon for having that many bushels of corn per acre. Ladies and gentlemen, today in the Midwest, they're producing up to 250 bushels of corn an acre. And you might say, well, how are they doing that? Well, yeah, there are some advances in herbicides and pesticides and things, but there's also, we're putting more fertilizer on the corn. Because we've got more availability of fertilizer, we put more on it. That excess fertilizer end up in what river you think in America? The Mississippi River. Matter of fact, uh, I tell people upstream, watch what you put in that water in the Mississippi River, because that's what we drink in New Orleans. <laughs> and the part that gets past New Orleans, it goes out into the Gulf, and it ends up, uh, has created this 800 square mile dead zone. That, right now, is an impossible problem. Because when I talk to engineers and scientists, they tell me, well, generally it's impossible to clean the water in the Mississippi River. It might be hard, but it ain't impossible. We can do it. It's these type moonshots we're going to have to go after, folks. We're going to have to get these leaders that you're producing not just to be concerned about being an entrepreneur and going to open uh, uh, a technical a business someplace. We're not to solve these hard problems associated with going from 7 to 10 million people. We have to figure that out. Now, you know, one of the tools that's going to help us be aware of what the challenges are is uh, social media. I I'm going to give away five books tonight at the end of this. If anybody in here tweet, or say something on Facebook about what I said. Is that a deal? I already did. You already did? All right. Well, I'm going to give away 10 books. <laughs> How many of you uh, use Twitter? Okay, take a look around. We're about what? 30%? Okay. How many of you use Facebook? Okay, we got a few more. You got to keep up with them babies. About <laughs> uh, 50%. Let me just say this. If you're in charge of my babies, my kids, when I send them to the university, you don't have an option. You
you've got to be on social media. So get with it. Don't leave this conference without a Facebook or a Twitter account. You got it? That's my challenge to you. Gene Andrew, will you do the check off before people leave? Please. Uh, since these young people started walking in the room about 30 seconds ago, I noticed they're coming in. In 30 seconds, 161,000 tweets were sent. The Pope tweets. The President <laughs> tweets. President of countries tweet. I said they tweet, you ought to be a tweeter too. <laughs> As President Bush used to say, the Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be in the front of leading these young people. We have to show them how to create content on social media. How to get this word that we're talking about, this challenge that we're dealing with going into the 21st century. How are we going to go from 7 to 10 million people? Ladies and gentlemen, it's not an option. We're going to have to change. One of the things on the Dean's uh, agenda is human capital. We've got to invest in that human capital. Uh, on that video, uh, those of you that might have watched it through, at some point in time during Katrina, the Friday of Katrina, Katrina hit Monday, that Friday, I was walking uh, near the uh, Riverside Hilton Hotel, and a young lady approached me with twin baby boys in her arm. She was 19 years old, single mom. These little boys were about nine months old. Uh, they had blood coming out of their nose. They were dehydrated. And we took those babies, and we walked about a block over to a Coast Guard barge, and a Coast Guard medic uh, hydrated those babies. And then we brought a Black Hawk helicopter in, one of our finest crews, and we gave those babies a million dollar ride. We flew to Baton Rouge, where they went immediately into the hospital, and they got excellent medical care. But when I saw those babies, and we picked them up, literally on the street, I got angry, because I wanted to know what was this young lady doing by herself on the street with these two babies? Was her husband in Iraq? That wasn't the answer. Where? What was she doing there with those two babies? And right behind her was a girlfriend with a little girl. And they, they evacuated all at the same time. You see, my fear is, based on the data, when you look at the big data, and I know you've got a data man here I've been talking to you about that that the data will show that if those little boys are not reading at fourth grade level by the time they're 10 years old, they will have over a 40% chance to have a run-in with the law by the time they're 14. So investing in human capital in America is not an option, it's an obligation. Think about those little boys. This year, we're going to celebrate or commemorate the 10th year uh, of Katrina. Those little boys will be right at 11 years old. Uh, we are going to start a campaign here in about 10 days to find them. And our objective is to find them, meet them on the street, reintroduce them to America, because they were kind of an iconic picture shown by CNN, glasses all over the world by CNN. And we want to present those young boys a scholarship to Southern University, Honorary Center for <laughs> Back to the mission that uh, we have to address as, as leaders and the teachers of leaders. Uh, next slide. Well, I'm talking to myself, right? <laughs> 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 I don't take orders from myself. Uh, that is what we were faced with. Uh, we spent $114 billion since Katrina, but this thing came ashore between here and Mississippi and uh, the western uh, part of Louisiana. 
It was uh, 205 miles wide from the center, uh, and it came in like a deadly force. It, it, it again reminded us that on any given day, Mother Nature can destroy anything built by man. And we need to get over it. Because uh, Katrina's come what? It can come again. And if you look down here off the coast of Florida, can't see it too well on this map, but a later one I'll show you. Uh, Katrina came into Biloxi with a 27-foot wall of water. It pushed a 17-foot wall of water through Lake Gore into the city and over top the canals, the, the levees, and flooded 80% of the city of New Orleans. It has happened before and it can happen again. We must remind our people, we must embrace technology, we must uh, invent new technology. You know, a lot of the people that we evacuated from Katrina were elderly people that were in nursing homes. And when they got to faraway stations, people would say, why did would call me and said, why didn't you send these elderly people up here without medical records? They said, well, we just moved them. And this nurse in Atlanta shared a story with me where she said, I met a lady on Sunday evening after Katrina at Dobbins Airfield. She was a nurse at Emory University in Atlanta. And she asked this elderly lady what her name was. And in a moment of consciousness, she said, my name is Izzy. And she said, Ms. Izzy, how old are you? She said, I'm 93. And she said, Sugar, what medications are you on? And she said, baby, I'm on that little red pill. <laughs> you know what? We still haven't fixed that problem. We have not fixed that problem with electronic medical records. We have not fixed that problem. And if we had another Katrina, whether it happened here in New Orleans, or it happened in Houston, or it happened in Miami, uh, or somewhere along the Florida coast, we still haven't fixed that problem. Because too many people thought it was too hard to do. We have the technology to do it. We've got to create the will to do it. Are you with me on that? We, six months after Katrina, I was off in Chicago, and a lady challenged me after a speech. She said, hey, Gerald, why don't you separate those black babies from their moms? So I stood up. And I put my punky piece stance on. I said, look. <laughs> what the hell have you been getting your news from? Kanye West? <laughs> we had to lighten the room up a little bit there. It was tense. Because she was speaking for something that she had seen. Babies traveling without their moms. And I said, well, let me explain to you what happened. It's really, it's not as bad as it looked. I said, what happened was, during the evacuation, we had, by Friday, we had over 200 helicopters here. A helicopter was going into a bridge site on the top of the interstate here in the city. And it would be a few adults and several children, sometimes eight, ten children. And uh, the adults had put the children on the helicopters. And the adults stayed behind. I mean, that, that is what people do. And as a result of that, we separated kids from their parents. Now, we certainly should have some technology to solve that, but we don't. And we still haven't solved that problem. And those kids got a ride and went off to uh, uh, Triage Center at LSU and at Southern, and they were sent to uh, hospitals around the country. And that's the way it happened. But to the eyes of this lady, we separated kids from their parents. Now, let me ask y'all a question that's going to seem a little awkward. How many of you have dogs? Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, how many of you have chips in your dog so you can find them? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, you yuckers, y'all all that and that. I <laughs> that little dog. <laughs> now, how many of you have children? All right, you put your hand down. How many of you have chips in your children so you can find them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, we got one. I hope he didn't get lost and he keep coming back home. <laughs> the good news tomorrow, he reports his foot better at the end of the school, so we don't know where he is for the next few months. But that being said, think about an opportunity here. As you know, on that, your impossible list for your students. You created technology that would solve that problem. 
that meet uh, our social norms as well as our uh, cultural norms. No, we probably won't want to put a chip in Little Johnny. Uh, but it could be another piece of technology, right? Matter of fact, we already have the technology. We just won't make the decision. All we gotta do is take that little baby's eye, a picture of their eyes at birth, and we can tell who they are anywhere. So from an aircraft at 15,000 feet, if we can see the eyes. But we don't want to do that, right? Or we can take DNA samples of everybody and solve the problem. We don't want to do that either. The army took my DNA, they didn't ask me, they just went through the channel, I said, open your mouth. <laughs> and it was open, it didn't hurt. And you know what? It had, had no repercussions from that. But we can solve that problem. We already have the technology, but we won't make the decision. That's one of those things we can leave to the law school people to work on. How we change policy. But the students you have trained would have to come up with some of those solutions of how we're going to clean that big blob of uh, uh, pollution that's out there in the Gulf. How we're going to get uh, power and energy to a mob overseas right now who just finished uh, a chicken dinner and have no place uh, refrigerated to put it in and has to throw it out. Or somebody who want to preserve their medicine. And you know the energy uh, power as we know it is very fragile. Our whole energy system is, is fragile. Uh, our grid is fragile from everything from uh, those great storms that come. How many of you ever lived in any period of time without uh, electricity? Yeah, some of you have. You know that feeling. The feeling of hopelessness. And you know, we can be sitting here right now, although we put a man on the moon, we can be sitting here right now, and two squirrels can be playing around on the damn transformer outside and turn the lights out. <laughs> That's how fragile our electrical grid is. But we put a man on the moon. But I'm here to think that one of those students that you are training will create a business model and create a business plan and collaborate with their buddies and they'll make a little box the size of this notebook that they will be able to order uh, through uh, Amazon or order it in a drone, bring it to the house within a couple hours, drop it off. Uh, you pick this thing up, you take it in the closet, you plug it in, and if the electricity goes out, it runs the house for two weeks. When I tell that to the engineering students over at Southern and LSU, you know what they tell me? Oh, boss, you don't understand how electricity works. <laughs> <laughs> hey, electricity don't work that way. Water doesn't have been done yet, right? What are the students you are training going to have to figure out a solution to that? Because those two million people, I have a dream that they will get energy and never have a power line running in front of the house. It'll show up, a drone, drop it off, take it in the house, and run the house for a year. Ten years. That's where we're going to have to go. It's not an option that we're going to have to look at things like food security. Uh, think about your, uh, one of the students you're training will create an app because they've taught a computer how to taste and smell. And again, when I go around the yard and I talk to the kids over in the, uh, young people over in the computer science department, I said, talking about a computer taste and smell, you know what they tell me? Oh, boss, you don't understand how a computer works. You know? <laughs> Computer's about X's and O's. Computer can't taste and smell. Well, I was giving this speech about two months ago off the coast of Georgia, <coughs> and an executive from Apple, company was there. And he, he called me over the side afterwards and he appreciated the joke. And he said, we have just transferred a perfume smell from Paris to New York through a computer. Mm. Uh, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Now what is this going to do for you and your children that are off in college when they get an app 
He'll be able to open a refrigerator and say, is there anything safe to eat here? <laughs> toward 10 billion people in the world and the students that the leaders that you are creating are going to be the ones that's going to lead this change they're going to have to do the impossible we don't have an option because we already have 2 billion people that are disenfranchised that don't have clean water that don't have uh, uh, energy in their homes and on top of that of that 7 billion people in the world today 4 billion, 3 billion of them live on less than 4 dollars a day now think about it, those of you that have kids at home, they go to school and they're hanging out while you're up here in the street, how long did it take them from the time they got up this morning before they blew through four dollars? Think about it. Some of them before they got to their first class, because they stopped by one of them coffee shops and they got one of them coffee and not a lot of dollars. <laughs> This friction that's been created, this tension over water and resources. We are 5% of the world's population. We consume 25% of the world's resources right here in America. The students that you're training are going to have to try to bring that in balance. The war, as we see it right now in Syria, actually started over water. But tribes started to nudge each other to get closer to a safer and more secure water supply. And as they nudged each other, friction started. And it was a tribal thing. Then it became a national thing inside of Syria. Right now, we've got a war going on between Georgia, Alabama, and Florida over water. Because Georgia don't have a ground source of water. particular a spot on the ground in northern Georgia, the head uh, engineer for that project went to the governor at the time and said, hey, we need to invest in a different piece of technology to make sure we get our northern border correct. You know what he was told? Don't worry about it, man. Just go up there and pick a hot top and get it. So he went up there with old technology, and he missed the Tennessee River by half a mile. You can look at the map right now, northern Georgia misses the Tennessee River by half a mile. Because the absence of somebody didn't want to invest in the current technology. We don't have an option, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to challenge these young people to do it. Now, can you talk to yourself? By example of leadership come three points from our revolutionary army. And you look at this and you say, ooh, where we are. I don't see any of our people on there. But we were there. 20% of George Washington's army were African Americans. But you know, we haven't arrived at building a back of the boat. The march of AC. The lesson in leadership here is this. Because in that is a lesson. That to lead requires sacrifice. And if you're not sacrificing, you're not leading. And as a leader on any given day, you should be right on the edge of being fired if you want to move the ball. Because you need to be chasing the impossible. In this case, Washington, himself, a slave owner, was focused on one thing, that was freedom. Freedom for our nation, our people, our ancestors. 20% of his army, African American, themselves were not free. But they bought into this concept of freedom that one day they could be free. So as we look here today and we talk about how challenging things are, look at what they're doing here. They're crossing a river at night in little boats. They don't even own boats. They practice a concept called uh, borrowing other people's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or as we used to 
saying the army tops, and the S is that something else. So they borrowed a boat, they crossed the river. What was the status of our nation? The capital of Washington had been burned, and the one in Philadelphia was threatened. 50% of Washington's army is our AWOL. It is Christmas. 20% of his army are African Americans, and they are slaves. And he's telling them we're going to cross the river tonight and go attack the most powerful army in the world, the British Army. So when we sit around and say, you know, boss, we would teach these kids if we had more of this and more of that. We got to get past the challenges of the day. As Washington and his men adapted and overcome, because they were driven by a mission. In a mission, you don't stop because times get hard. When I go visit our friends in politics in Washington, uh, they see these days and they say, well, General, you just know how hard it is up here. You know, at about 12 o'clock, we'll leave in a black car, we'll go to K Street, have a $100 lunch. We come back and they have a few more meetings by 7 o'clock. We get another black car, we go down to K Street and have a $200 debt. And say, you see how hard it is out here? <laughs> <laughs> so this was a time in America when it was hard. When we got people who are slaves fighting for a concept of freedom when they're not free themselves. So if the world wasn't fair, it's never going to be fair. Think about those young kids around the world today that don't have clean water in their homes. Think about those young kids who do not, don't have power or electricity in their homes. How fair is the world for them? Ladies and gentlemen, the leaders you are training are going to have to solve these problems. And the three quick points on leadership here is teach them to do the routine things well. Teach your students to do the routine things well. Teach them that don't be afraid to take on the impossible. Washington wasn't scared. He and his men were not scared to take on the impossible. Because they took on the impossible, we did today as a nation. And last but not least, teach those students, please, don't be afraid to act even if you're being criticized. Can you imagine what would happen if we had this battle today and uh, Wolf Blitzer was on one side of Washington and Ronald Rivera was on the other side? And they'd be given 24 hour news. Well, here's George, he's standing on the front of the boat. George, we have a word with you there, General. <laughs> and they would be telling us, George is going to take these boys out there tonight and get them killed. Some of them don't even have shoes on. They don't have proper coats. They don't have proper ammunition. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what they did so we could be here today. And from that day, it still took a century to even get close to what we are as a nation today. That in leadership requires sacrifice. If you're not sacrificing, you might be managing. And that might be okay. If you want to live the rest of your life dealing with the minimum, then be a damn manager. If you want to lead into the future and change things so you're not dealing with the minimum, be a leader. Teach them to be leaders. Teach them to solve problems. Teach them to be bold. And teach them to create teams wherever they go. And to be a part of a team. And understand that coming into the team, it may not look like it's fair. But remind them of this story when it really wasn't fair. That's the challenge I see in the new normal of the 21st century, or what we're going to have to do. Because every now and then, Mother Nature comes to visit, as it did during Katrina. <coughs> this is just a picture of, uh, this is part of the convention center. Uh, those two pictures on the left, and that's a picture of the buses that finally showed up. This is, uh, for those of you in geographical challenge, this is a map of the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> and that big red line in the middle is the Mississippi River. And the native people call that Mississippi River the father of the waters. And we got to stop sounding stupid sometimes. If you live next to the father of the waters, what you should expect to happen? It's going to flood. Just like it is up in Shreveport right now. We got four people up in Shreveport who uh, bought that property right next to the river and they're flooded. When I go out in the Midwest, 
asked people last call time. I was in Canada yesterday, and uh, Tuesday I was in Atlanta at the Flood Managers Conference, and uh, people asked me, General, how do you know if you live in a flood zone? Well, my answer is this simple. If you can see water from your house, you're in a damn flood zone. <laughs> <laughs> we ought to stop acting so profoundly stupid sometimes. <laughs> if you were in a city, and as you walk around and you walk in front of the hospital, and you were looking up at ships, <laughs> your generator ought not be in the damn basement. <laughs> and that's what we found right here in this city. You know, the mayor and the governor got hung out the drive over Katrina. But many of the issues that really caused a lot of the problems we're associated with uh, were engineering issues. And when you ask the engineers who done it, the engineers said, well, the architects done it. So I go to run the architect, now why don't y'all put the generator in the basement? And the architect said, well, the CFO said that's all the money we had. Or we want to save some money. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to build smart design. We're going to have to build better. We're going to have to be more, we're going to have to act like we know how to read. I saw a picture of a house underwater in Shreveport, Cattle Parish today with the levee and the man built his house between the levee and the river.
we span around the world, we can take care of this. But it's going to take the people in this room, men, you sit right here, to create that change. We need to create that change. Chapter 9 of this book, uh, I say this, is that we've got to save our best leadership for when we get home. Because those of us with jobs, we don't have an uh, option. We've got to raise good kids. We have to save our best leadership for when we get home. We have to save our best leadership for when we get home. Here's why I wrote that chapter. I wrote that chapter because what happened to me when I was the first Army commander. Uh, after about three and a half years of deploying troops to Iraq and Afghanistan and several other places around the world, I started to get police reports on my desk in the morning that says Colonel so-and-so or Sergeant Major so-and-so or Sergeant so-and-so had an infraction with a teenage child at home. He's been deployed, he's come back, and there's friction in the house. So I went out to my formation and I started to talk to him about this topic of saving the best leadership for when you get home. And this is the context I put it in. Uh, my wife and I, we have four children, we moved 24 times. We moved both of our girls in their senior year. And when we did that, people would say, oh boy, you're gonna mess them girls up. They're not gonna get to go to prom with their senior class, blah, 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 blah. What, is, what ring they going to wear, blah, 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 blah. But you see, I watch the house on a prayer. And I watch the mangoes. They moved across America in a couple of wagons. And they stopped to read a little bit to pick up some rocks. A storm would come and read a little bit to pick up some more damn rocks. Then one day, Laura grew up and she became a teacher. I said, you could get your education that way, you ought to be able to do what? Get in the back of that station wagon and go to another town and get your education. And I thought it was better to keep the team together. Because the team is important. I thought it was better to keep the team together. So we kept the team together. And as years passed, people asked me how we do that. I said, it's amazing what happened when you take a, a, a college, a high school senior, Going into a senior year, you move them uh, two weeks before the senior year start, but you make the problem a little bit easier when there's a brand new Volkswagen sitting in the front door. <laughs> yeah, you ain't got to be stupid about it. <laughs> After all, they're just kids, you got to lead them. <laughs> and you know, they turned out fine. They turned out fine. But my own reflection, and raise your kids, that's hard work. And the reason I tell you you gotta save your best leadership for when you get home is hard work. I remember when my daughter number one was born, I walked in the back door of this little 1100 square foot army house, and uh, a pretty little wife would be standing there, I'd go look in the box in the corner, little baby would have sat there sleeping. First few months, it ain't no problem. <laughs> few months past, I'd open the back door of that house, that thing would meet me at the back door. <laughs> Climb up on my combat boots, get all into my fatigues. I was sitting there trying to eat some spaghetti and meatballs, just slobbering off. Couldn't get enough of one day. Then I remember that one day I came home. Where's daughter number one? She's not here. She's next door. Go get her. And then a few years passed. I was a major at Fort Leavenworth in the staff college. Come on, where's daughter number one? One Friday afternoon. Well, she spent the weekend in the country with farm girl. And one day you come home and you see this thing set across the table from you, and you say, what the hell is that? <laughs> Dressed all funny with metal and stuff, and you said, uh, Sugar, what'd you learn today, nothing? Who'd you see, nobody? And you know, I would share that lesson with colleagues and relatives, and say, Russ, don't worry about that. That's just a fad they're going through. A fad by you know what? That's a leadership challenge. And you better deal with it. You better deal with it. You better deal with it. Remember that thing I described. Come and sit down at the table. Many lessons in leadership. Though many of you in here are here because you enjoyed that privilege of sit down at the table and somebody asked you what was going on in your life. And they wasn't looking at a blackberry. You understand? Who did you see today? 
What did you learn? What challenges you had? Some of those babies are being bullied. Some of them are being forced to do things that they should not be doing. And too many of us are too busy on the fast track to be noticing what's happening in their lives. Just like my soldiers, just like me, have had that experience. We have to save our best leadership for when we get home. Look, being the third, third commander of first army, pretty easy gig. You know, I fly over here, fly over there, have my own jet, have my own crew, have my own posse, have my own fleet of black trucks. So I've done all that. That's why I don't do all the big jobs. So that's what I mean. <laughs> but if I had problems at work, this is what I'd do. You know, I've had a colonel giving me some smack. You know, the guy, doesn't, he's not cooperative. He's not getting along. What's wrong with that guy? So I walk in, I call my chief staff, man, chief, you know that Colonel Smith? I say, yeah. I say, you know, I think they can use his leadership in South Korea. Make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> and in about two weeks, we'd have a big old ceremony, we'd give him a medal, get him on a plane, and be damn gone. <laughs> That's how you have a problem that will work. <laughs> solve their problems. So while we are out creating leaders, we've got to raise good kids. You with me with that? Yes. You've got to train your students and you need to talk to them about that. Because some of them will think that the only path to success is they leave everything at work. Leaving that work is relatively easy. Leaving that home is hard. Because this is your family. We got to save enough of that goodness, that greatness that we have, that everybody tell us about that we have at work, and the people come around and admire the greatness that what you do, and what you do at form, and the knowledge that you're sharing. You got to save some of that for when you get home. Yeah, we don't have the option. We got to raise good kids. This year we're going to put about a hundred thousand veterans out in the army. We generate about a hundred thousand lonely every year, but we're going to have an extra hundred thousand coming out in the next 18 months, because the war is about over. Uh, I need you to create a system in your schools. Uh, we've got to change how we are bringing these veterans into your school system. We got people still living in the last century when it comes to a role of veterans. They've served our nation well. They need a job. 24 hours in a day, right? 23 of them. Hours of a day, we lose a veteran. They kill themselves. 23 suicides a day, every day, here in America. Almost 70% of them don't have a job. They have no place to get up to go to in the morning at the time they kill themselves. We need to have a vision in our universities. There's no reason it shouldn't stop at the HBC News. That if you show up and you got a DD-214, and they could be the middle of March. And that student walk in that business office and say, I want to go to school. He said, son, come on here. Come here, young lady. But what do you want to study? You got any idea? You don't have an idea? Okay, go down here and take the English class. Go get in this class right now. And you put them in school. Because you know what? It's going to take a little while because you're dealing with the federal government. The check is going to come. <laughs> But if you tell that student, come back uh, at the end of the semester, go, uh, go online and uh, get your paperwork straight, guess what happened in that period of time? A student get discouraged and they don't come back. And they get a piece of job someplace and they get tied up in this. Now they got a car they're trying to pay for and they got a part-time job and they're dealing with stuff in their head and they're feeling underappreciated. A veteran ought to be able to walk into your camp, and this is a business proposition, because a college is about a business. A university is a business. This is a business proposition. Veterans should be able to walk into any university and show his DD-214 and go to class. And he should be able to start in March, just like he should be able to start in July. Just get started. We need to have a fast track to put them in school. And put them in school in the middle of the year. You know, if you spent four tours getting shot at in Iraq, 
I'm pretty sure that I would take care of a lot of your freshman uh, geography class you have to take. <laughs> I said, that might count. <laughs> you understand? That just might count. You with me? We need to figure out if the HBCUs know how to do it. I went to an HBCU and I had trouble writing and reading. I admit it. But I went to an HBCU. And you know the rest of the story. Because after I could walk up to my teacher and say, I need help. The teacher wasn't looking at an iPad or a, uh, a news report. And, you know, it wasn't always, you know, touching me. <laughs> okay, boy, send me in my office of Walmart and tell me how. But that's the way it was. Because I wouldn't have been here today, I don't think, if I didn't go to an HBCU that took that time to say, come see me. And the three points of leadership, teach them to do the routine things well. Teach them and make it a reactionary process that they are not afraid to take on the impossible. And as a dean, create an impossible list. We don't have time to wait. Create an impossible list and let them go after it. And last but not least, don't be afraid to act, even if you're being criticized. Okay, I'm going to stay around a little while. I think Dean has got, some, got a plan for you to get the boogie on here. I'll be off in the corner. I appreciate you listening. Uh, I, uh, I'm blessed to be able to go around the country and do public speaking now. And uh, I enjoy doing it. And I can come to your place, too. So thank you very much. God bless you. God bless you.